What is the plea of your client at this time? The plea is not guilty, Your Honor. Sorry. Let's talk about Chad Dorman out of Ohio and catch up on his case. Honor, thank you. Let's talk about his wife, Laura Hensley, and all of their money problems. I want to talk about rumors and reality and everything we know thus far. Now, Chad was scheduled to appear in court this Monday, June 26, but they kind of switched it up on us, so he already appeared on Friday, June 23rd. That whole video is coming up just in case you haven't seen it, but Chad had the nerve to plead not guilty, which is pretty standard, even though he already allegedly confessed to felling his three sons, his three young, beautiful sons, before they had the chance to grow from saplings into mighty oak trees. But stay tuned for that heartbreaking courtroom footage where you can hear more details about what Chad really did to his sons, even so far as chasing one, firing a rifle into his back, pulling one back towards the house, ripping the youngest son from his mother's arms, all of those horrible details. Previously, we saw Chad in court the first time, which we've already gone over. You saw the body cam footage and everything. And during the first court appearance, Chad squeezes his eyes and pretends like he's so upset and crying, but he gets it enough together at the end to mutter CCO2, which is protective custody, reportedly. So even though he's so upset, supposedly, over what he did to his sons and, by extension, the trauma he caused to his stepdaughter, Alexis, and to his wife, Laura, he's so upset, but then he can think of himself again while asking to be placed in protective custody because even he knows the horrific nature of this case has made it gone viral. Worldwide, people are disgusted by his alleged actions. So he wants to be in protective custody so no one will harm poor little Chad. But as I research more and more into this case, I'm seeing signs of his selfishness from what little we know. I'm also researching more into the couple's money problems, when they bought the house, what might have been brewing according to Facebook rumors, to prompt Chad to perform such a horrible act. People are even surmising that Chad probably pled not guilty, not only to get the death penalty perhaps off the table if he can work out a plea deal, but also to force a trial, to force his wife Laura to be there in person to testify against him just one more horrible act of hurting her just to see her again. According to Local12.com, one of Chad's neighbors, whom we've watched in a previous video, he was able to talk about the mistreatment to his boys and his wife before this tragedy. According to Richard King Cannon, Chad again was just a very angry man. He was always yelling at his wife and kids, but we've learned on one occasion, Richard King Cannon says that Chad got violent with his children. Quote, he tossed a couple of them around in the yard one day, tried to tell them to go in the house and pick them up and threw them. So I believe Richard saw what he saw. And of course, hindsight is 2020. A lot of people are asking, well, why wasn't that reported? And we don't know what has been reported or not. We don't know any kind of child protective services reports or anything that has gone on because those types of records tend to be private. But the rumors are flying on Facebook about what Laura was doing, perhaps right before Chad created this horrific tragedy. Now, this is just a rumor. I will delineate rumors from facts in my videos, but I do pay attention to rumors. I do try and debunk the ones I can. You know, there was some woman on TikTok and she was talking about a different Chad and some people were running with it thinking that was Chad's ex-wife. So no, I understand when stuff can be debunked. The other rumors are a little bit more pervasive and they might turn into facts. Like the rumor that Laura was allegedly packing to leave Chad when he may have come home early from work and I still don't know his line of work. Laura was either en route to her sister's house or 
en route to leave him and allegedly he came home early and saw she was leaving him and that's when he enacted this violence. Someone wrote on Facebook in one of the many groups I'm in regarding this case, it is my understanding from a friend who knows one of the neighbors that the sister was there to help her sister pack as she was leaving. Now some are saying no, it wasn't her sister, it wasn't her mother, it wasn't Laura's family she was packing to go to her sister's. We don't know, you know how the game of telephone is, the story can change. They were supposed to be gone before he came home from work, but he got home earlier. Now this is hearsay, but from a good source. Immediately got his gun and did this. It makes more sense than anything I've heard so far, wrote one person. She had told him she was leaving a few months back if he didn't stop drinking. He in turn told her that he would kill the kids before he let her take them, he did. Now that we do take with a grain of salt, but early on in a lot of these crime cases, in the Facebook groups or, or even in YouTube comment sections, we can find grains of truth. Where there's smoke, there's fire. And this is why I pay attention to rumors. Some people say, oh, don't pay attention to them at all. But I do because I like to figure out what's happening in these cases. For example, in the Letitia Stout case, she was convicted of getting rid of her beautiful 11-year-old stepson, Gannon Stauk. Early on, I made videos about it since 2020. You can find a lot of the interrogation videos and videos on that case up on my channel. It's called Plunder Body Cam Videos. People love watching body cam videos, not only the Stouch case and others, but thank you to the docket on YouTube for getting Letitia Stouk's case file. And it was not $30,000 like they had quoted him. Anyway, when I was covering Letitia's case, a young girl, a teenager, had commented on one of my videos. She said, oh, Letitia did come into Petco twice the day Gannon was reported missing. She was acting weird. She was moving to the window. Eventually, cops came into Petco and they took the video footage. Well, a lot of people, some people just attacked this young girl, this teenager, who commented on one of my videos. They called her, you know, some folks, they don't believe anything. They called her a liar. You just want to be involved in the case. Ah, oh, blah, 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 blah. No, that's a lie. What are you saying? I don't understand why people do this. And the young girl ended up deleting her comments because she was so attacked. Well, it turns out it was truth. After the case unfolded, the affidavit came out. Cops revealed Letitia's movements. She did, in fact, go to Petco twice. So I see this girl was telling the truth. Back then, you know, it's called a rumor. It's called, oh, wild speculation or whatever people say. You're lying, you're lying, you're lying. Anyway, this is why I like to go into the Facebook groups, Reddit, everywhere to figure out what's going on with a case. So that's why I'm paying attention to this rumor about Chad Dorman's wife, Laura, and whether she was really packing to leave. And did Chad somehow come home early? Was he, you know, stalking her or did he know her movements somehow and catch her? And, you know, was he like, oh, you're not going to leave me? And that's what he did. Meanwhile, folks on Facebook are also confirming the photo of Chad and who they say is his wife, Laura, from January 15th, 2022. That's when Chad posted this photo. There were only a few publicly available photos on Chad's Facebook. We already went over the photos of his cover and his, his profile photo and other photos of Chad and his boys that he had changed and published right there June 11th, only four days before the shootings. But back on January 15th, 2022, this other photo that Chad Dorman published was one he left on there. Just one of him and his wife. She looks really petite you know, like sledding. But once you read the comments, you'll get to see more of Chad's selfishness. You'll see his mom commented, love this picture, son. Gloria Dorman wrote that about a year ago, more than a year ago. Someone else wrote, great picture, love you guys. And Chad commented, night before at 11 p.m., I woke up everyone to build a snowman. Ha ha ha, I was scared the snow would melt. Now, if this were a kind parent, you could look at a comment like that as something sweet. It reminds me of that scene in the movie Stepmom I Love, where Susan Sarandon's character, she's dying of cancer. She wakes up her daughter, 
for a special moment because it's snowing. They ride a horse. It's a beautiful moment. She wakes up her daughter. Her daughter's not that young in the movie. They go on this ride. It's beautiful snow everywhere. It's a special moment. Okay, stuff like that I can see. But for Chad to write that the night before this photo was taken at 11 p.m. And this, mind you, was a year ago. So his boys were not three, four, and seven. His boys were two, three, and six at the time. I can't imagine all the kids being asleep. You know how when you're a mom, especially a mom of three young boys and an older daughter, when you finally get them down to bed, you're like, ah, oh, you know, finally, it's our time, it's relaxing time. But imagine your husband, probably drunk from what we know of Chad's problems, waking up everyone in the home to go play in the snow. If it were a kind dad, yeah, that might be a cute and special moment gesture. But knowing he did what he did, we can look at this as a selfish moment. 11 p.m., I woke everyone up to build a snowman. I'm sorry, you don't wake two and three and six-year-old kids up at 11 p.m. to build a snowman. His mom had written, you are awesome, Chad. Mom just loves you. You think of everything like I did for you boys. Just love this. So Chad must have a brother, I'm assuming. What could have been a sweet moment now just reeks of selfishness to me. But let's talk about the house that Chad and Laura bought. It was built in 1997, but it's now this infamous house that people will always associate with this tragedy and I don't know what'll come of it. But on March 18th, 2015, Chad C. Dorman, again, another guy with the name Christopher in the middle, the one who carries Christ, became the grantee of the infamous home in Monroe Township. It sits on 3.4381 acres, according to the Claremont County Recorder. So a mortgage was recorded on March 8th of 2016, and both Laura Hensley and Chad Dorman signed the 30-year mortgage. Now, Chad's wife, her name is out there. It's been published. It's a matter of public record. Initially, I was only saying her first name, but now that it's been published and it's out there, I'm saying her name. So it lists Chad C. Dorman, a married man, as the borrower of the open-end mortgage. The loan was for $93,279, and he promised to pay off the debt no later than April 1st, 2046, so it was a 30-year mortgage. And that lines up with what Zillow says the home sold on March 28th, 2016 for $95,000. So I'm not sure if they put down anything, just a small amount. But pretty soon, money problems would begin. So according to Claremont County Public Records, Laura R. Hensley, not Laura A. There's a different woman out there with different charges, which aren't Laura's. You'll just see civic complaints for Chad's wife due to money problems, a couple of traffic violations, nothing criminal under her name. But the money issues will go over, I found for Laura. It's in no way to embarrass her or a victim shame or blame or anything. Many of us have had money issues, myself included. I will tell on myself again, since I'm going to you know, talk about her money issues. I've been sued in the past by American Express when I had money issues. I had like a $4,500 balance. Thank God I paid it off so it didn't go any further than what we're going to read Laura's troubles go into. I feel sorry for Laura. I believe she's a victim. I've noticed some people coming down on Laura because some people are saying, why couldn't she protect her kids more? And you know, how was he able to lay out three of her kids? Well, now we know she was at least holding one and he ripped the child out of her arms and we can see how petite she is. I don't know. I, I feel like some people are judging her too harshly where we don't know what she's been through. She's obviously been living with this man who has been violent allegedly an alcoholic that couldn't have been easy and if it's true she was finally trying to get away from him and if that's what set him off i mean it's just a sad situation but the first one i found was a capital one bank judgment balance there was five thousand two hundred and two dollars and 22 cents owed 
The filing date on that was August 30th, 2019. The date of judgment, it took a while here, was March 31st, 2020. The judgment was granted for the plaintiff. It's a closed civil case. There was an attempt to garnish a pizzeria in Ohio. I'm not sure if that's where Laura worked temporarily. That garnishment on January 30th, 2023 was an attempt. There was a notice to judgment debtor request for hearing issued attempts to garnish as early as February of this year and March of this year. It said garnishment answer filed, not employer. So she must not be employed at that pizza place anymore. So all these debts are happening just like two or three years after they moved into that house in 2016. So there's a Capital One bank balance for 2124.19, closed civil case filed May 20th, 2019. And then there's Portfolio Recovery Associates LLC, a balance of 1,115.57, filed January 9th, 2019, date of judgment, June 18th, 2019. And that's a company, a large debt collection agency. They purchase delinquent accounts from banks and creditors like Citibank, Bank of America, Dell Financial, GE Capital, Gap, Lowe's, Lord & Taylor, JCPenney, Old Navy, Express, so we don't know what it was really for. And then there's a Discover Bank balance of $2,569.23. Civil case closed. File date was April 25th, 2018. Date of judgment was July 31st, 2018. A garnishment issued November 6, 2018. And there was a garnishment, I guess, sent to a pediatrics place. I'm assuming that's where she worked at the time. May 30th, 2019, there was a court order of garnishment. Uh, there was a garnishment hearing July 2nd, 2019. Then July 9th, 2019, there was a garnishment objection overruled. Someone must not have wanted her wages garnished. And then by August 12th, the garnishment was answered, filed, no funds, Park National Bank. I'm not sure what happened with a lot of this debt. I haven't found any bankruptcies for the couple yet or anything like that. Maybe they got paid off. Maybe she worked hard or Chad worked hard. Who knows? And maybe was able to pay off the debt. But what we do see here is a young couple moving into a house in 2016. So this year is 2023. I'll have to do some math here. They must have been having their little boy at that time around there because he was seven. Alexis, the older girl, who is the biological daughter of Laura. And people are trying to figure out, well, who's her bio dad? And Chad was in Alexis's life since she was a little girl, since she was three or four. So if that's true, it's really sad. Reportedly, Alexis called Chad dad she's been with him or looking at him as a father figure for over a decade since she's 14. So it's pretty sad that he would even enact all that trauma on her as well as Laura. I think of the pressure cooker of this couple moving into that house in 2016. They have the older girl, they had the older boy being born around that time, and then two more boys soon to follow all these money issues and Laura likely dealing with this abusive a-hole, just horrible. So I, I can see how money could get out of hand. Many of us have suffered from, you know, retail therapy or just taking care of kids. Sometimes it's easy, I'm sure, to throw all of them in the car, take a drive to Cincinnati, go spend a day, go shopping, and it can help temporarily you to forget the problems at home, you know, buying the boys clothes or activities or even charging groceries or who knows, we've all done it. Many of us have done it just to get away and things got out of hand and there's financial pressures, there's the pressure of just raising children. And if you have a husband who's being very mean on top of it, drinking too much. I imagine Laura seriously trying to get away from that household and Chad exploding at the knowledge. Too bad she couldn't have done it. I wish more stealthily. I wish he didn't show up and of course do what he did. The only good lesson of this cautionary tale could be to help other women or men. Of course, men are victims in a lot of domestic cases too. We've learned a lot over the years about how not to approach the spouse. 
And of course, this is in no way victim blaming. This is only teaching. A lot of people these days will teach you to secretly make your plans to leave. Don't ever announce or tell the abuser that you're leaving. To try and get as many ducks in a row as you can as possible and try and get to safety without being tracked. The little boy's funeral is coming up. There's an obituary that's been put out and Chad is due back in court in July. The obituary really tells you more about the little boys. Clayton Dorman, he's seven. Hunter Dorman, he's four and Chase Dorman, he's three. They call them three brothers bonded together in life and now for eternity as God has reeled them into heaven for unending days of fishing, playing outside way past bedtime, laughing loudly and nonstop giggling. They loved unconditionally, sharing their big hearts with anyone who they could make laugh and give them love. So that's what I start thinking of too when it gets too far with the tragedy or thinking of what Chad did. I literally start imagining the boys with Jesus, all these other victims, Gannon Stalk, all the victims, you know, we cover. I literally think of them up there, like the three little boys from Ohio just playing in that river or pond we see. I think of them having fun now. Hunter was fondly known as Hunter Dog. He loved going to the creek and catching frogs and his love of baseball extended beyond the ball field to his bed, an attachment like an extra arm to connect him to his ball and glove as he slept. That's so cute. So he kept his ball and glove with him as he slept. He loved calling his mom and sister pretty girls and telling them he loved them every day. Chase, fondly known as Chasers, loved swinging on swings and couldn't wait to be a baseball player like his brothers. He loved playing with dinos and pretending to be a superhero. He was the best cuddler, wanting his mama to stay close by and to give her many hugs. He will forever be known as Mama's Baby. They're survived by their loving family. So the visitation is Monday, June 26th. It is public. They say, please wear bright colors and join the family for the visitation on Monday from 4 to 8 p.m., followed by a celebration of life service, 8 p.m. at First Baptist Church, Glen Esty, Glen Est, I guess it is, on Old State Road in Batavia, Ohio. I know the funeral is open to the public. I'm not sure if it'll be streamed anywhere online. In lieu of flowers, they are asking to please send donations to the organization that provided so many happy memories for the Dorman family. And these donations will be used to make improvements to Field 4 in their honor. You can donate via Venmo to NR Youth Sports and placed Field 4 dedication in the memo. They have an address where checks can be mailed. We expect Chad Dorman back in court July 5th, 2023, 11 a.m. local time for his pretrial and we will see what happens with this case. Stay tuned to watch the full trial and to see him kind of, he wasn't really crying this time. It was so many charges being read and he was just kind of, yeah, yeah, I understand. And kind of like, whatever. So it was pretty uneventful. I guess not everyone was expecting his not guilty plea. And his case isn't closed. He, he's not out on bail or anything. They did just close off his charges in the lower court. And now the case is open in the court of common pleas. So Chad isn't out. He has not had his case closed. Stuff is still progressing and we will just stay tuned to see what happens. Jeremiah 23, 24. Who can hide in secret places so I cannot see them, declares the Lord. Do not I fill heaven and earth? declares the Lord. So no matter what we do, if we're not truly repentant, if Chad's tears are fake, if there's no repentance for him, if there's no change in him, I know people don't want to hear it sometimes. You know, you just want it to be so black and white, like he's evil, do away with him, you know, but there is still, while the blood runs red in our veins, a chance to repent and hope. You know, even an evil horrible monster like Jeffrey Dahmer allegedly reportedly started reading his Bible in jail, got baptized, gave his life to the Lord. We don't know who, whose hearts have really accepted God or not. Did Chris Watts really do it? I don't know. Again, it's not my place to say. I can't look at a person's heart and know what's in there. But for evildoers like these, that is the only hope they have left. And again, they better do it sooner than later because 
especially when you harm children going into some of these prisons, people tend not to stand for it. So we'll see what happens with Chad. Watch his court appearance and stay tuned for more. Thank you.
and then the court um, will send its own entry to the Supreme Court verifying that um, the clerk has sent a copy of the indictment to the Supreme Court. So I'll leave that record. All right.
the firearm specification, again, is three years mandatory, which must be served prior to and consecutive to any imposed prison sentence and a possible fine of $25,000. If convicted of the underlying aggravated murder charge without any aggravating circumstance specification, the possible penalties are life without parole, life with the possibility of parole after 30 years, life with the possibility of parole after 25 years, and life with the possibility of parole after 20 years. Again, the firearm specification is that three years mandatory, as well as the $25,000 fine. Thank you. Mr. Myers and Mr. Haynes, we agree, Judge. Okay. And Mr. Gordon, you understand. As to count three, Ms. Barron Allen. Thank you, Your Honor. Count three is also charged pursuant to Ohio Revised Code Section 290301A, aggravated murder on a specified felony. It also um, carries with it uh, multiple aggravated circumstance specifications, the victim under 13 specification, force of conduct specification, and felony murder specification, as well as that firearm specification. The possible penalties if convicted of the aggravated murder, as well as any of the aggravated circumstance specifications, would be death life without parole, life with the possibility of parole after 30 years, life with the possibility of parole after 25 years. Again, the firearm specification carries with it that three years mandatory, must be served prior to and consecutive to any post prison sentence and the $25,000 fine as possible. If convicted of the aggravated murder without any aggravating circumstance specification, the possible penalties would be life without parole, life with the possibility of parole after 30 years, life with the possibility of parole after 25 years, like with the possibility of parole after 20 years, and again, the firearm specification is three years mandatory and same time. Thank you. Um, as to count three, does the defense agree with the possible penalties that, that have been recited? Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. For the record, Mr. Haynes, Mr. Gorman, do you understand? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Baron Allen. As to count four, please. Thank you, Your Honor. Count four is charged pursuant to Ohio Revised Code Section 290301B, again, aggravated murder and unspecified felony. There are multiple aggravating circumstance specifications attached to that count as well. The same aggravating circumstance specifications of victim under 13, course of conduct specification and felony murder specification, as well as that firearm specification. Again, convicted of aggravated murder, as well as any of the aggravating circumstance specifications, the possible penalties would be death, life without parole, life with the possibility of parole after 30 years, or life with the possibility of parole after 25 years. The firearm specification again carries that three years mandatory, which must be served prior and consecutive to any imposed prison sentence, and the possible fine of $25,000. If convicted of aggravated murder without any aggravating circumstance specification, the possible penalties would be life without parole, life with the possibility of parole after 30 years, life with the possibility of parole after 25 years, like with the possibility of parole after 20 years, and then that same firearm specification of three years mandatory, and the same fire of $25,000. Thank you. Mr. Myers and Mr. Haynes, we agree, Your Honor. You agree. Mr. Gorman, you understand? Thank you. As to count five, Ms. Barron Allen. Thank you, Your Honor. Again, count five is charged pursuant to Ohio Revised Code Section 290301B, aggravated murder, unspecified felony. Also attached are multiple aggravating circumstance specifications, the victim under 13 specification, force of conduct specification, felony murder specification, and firearm specification. If convicted of the underlying crime of aggravated murder, as well as any of the aggravating circumstance specification, the possible penalties would be death, life without parole, life with the possibility of parole after 30 years, life with the possibility of parole after 25 years. The firearm specification is three years mandatory, <coughs> possible prison sentence. It must be served prior to and consecutive to any imposed prison sentence, the possible fine of $25,000. If convicted of the aggravated murder charge without any of the aggravated circumstances specifications, the possible penalties would be life without parole, life with the possibility of parole after 30 years, life with the possibility of parole after 25 years, life with the possibility of parole after 20 years, and the firearm specification, again, that three years mandatory, and the same fine of $25,000. Thank you, Mr. Myers and Mr. Hain. We agree. Mr. Gorman, you understand? Thank you, Ms. Baron Allen. Has to count six, please. Thank you, Your Honor. Again, count six is charged pursuant to Ohio Revised Code Section 290301B, aggravated murder and unspecified felony. Attached to that count are multiple aggravated circumstance specifications, the victim under 13 specification, course of conduct specification, felony murder specification, as well as a firearm specification. If convicted of the underlying charge of aggravated murder, as well as any of the aggravated circumstance specifications, the possible penalties would be a death, life without parole, 
life with the possibility of parole after 30 years or life without life with the possibility of parole after 25 years. The firearm specification carries that three years mandatory, which must be served prior and consecutive to any post prison sentence. A fine of $25,000 is also possible. If convicted of aggravated murder without any aggravated circumstance specification, the possible penalties are life without parole, life with the possibility of parole after 30 years, life with the possibility of parole after 25 years, life with the possibility of parole after 20 years, again, that's firearm specification, three years mandatory, and that same possible fine of $25,000. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Mr. Myers and Mr. Haynes, do you agree with that? Yes, sir. Um, Mr. Gordon, do you understand? All right. Thank you, Ms. Barron. I'll ask the count seven, please. Thank you, Your Honor. Count 7 is charged pursuant to Ohio Revised Code Section 290301C, aggravated murder, uh, unspecified felony. There are multiple aggravated circumstance specifications attached, including victim under 13 specification, a course of conduct specification, felony murder specification, and firearm specification. The possible penalties are possibility of death, life without parole, life with the possibility of parole after 30 years, life with the possibility of parole after 25 years, Firearm specification carries with it three years mandatory, which must be served prior and consecutive to any prison term, uh, possibility of a fine up to $25,000. If convicted of aggravated murder without any aggravating circumstance specification, the possible penalties are life without parole, life with the possibility of parole after 30 years, life with the possibility of parole after 25 years, life with the possibility of parole after 20 years, and the same firearm specification of three years mandatory, and that same possible fine of $25,000. We agree, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Haynes. Uh, Mr. Dorman, do you understand? Thank you, Ms. Barron. I'll ask to count eight, please. Thank you, Your Honor. As to count eight, again, that is charged pursuant to revised code, section 290301C, aggravated murder, and unspecified felony. Um, there are multiple aggravated circumstance specifications attached to that count as well. The victim under 13 specification, course of conduct specification, felony murder specification, and firearm specification. <coughs> if convicted of a crime of aggravated murder along with any of that aggravating circumstance specification, the possible penalties would be death, life without parole, life with the possibility of parole after 30 years, life with the possibility of parole after 25 years. The firearm specification carries with it three years mandatory, which must be served prior to second to any imposed prison term, and a fine of up to $25,000. If convicted of aggravated murder without any aggravating circumstance specification, the possible penalties are life without parole, life with the possibility of parole after 30 years, life with the possibility of parole after 25 years, life with the possibility of parole after 20 years, again, the same firearm specification, three years mandatory, and the same possible fine of $25,000. Thank you. Mr. Myers and Mr. Hain? We agree, right. Mr. Dorman, do you understand? I'm sorry. Honor. Thank you. Uh, as to count nine, Ms. Barron now. Again, count nine similarly is charged pursuant to Ohio Revised Code Section 290301C, aggravated murder and unclassified felony. Attached are multiple aggravated circumstance specifications, including the victim under 13 specification, a course of conduct specification, felony murder specification, and firearm specification. The possible penalty if convicted of both the aggravated murder and any of the aggravated circumstance specifications would be death, life without parole, life with the possibility of parole after 30 years, life with the possibility of parole after 25 years, the firearm specification carries with it three years mandatory, which must be served prior to and consecutive to any imposed prison sentence, and a possible fine of $25,000. If convicted of aggravated murder without any of the aggravated circumstances specifications, the possible penalties are life without parole, life with the possibility of parole after 30 years, life with the possibility of parole after 25 years, life with the possibility of parole after 20 years. Again, the firearm specification carries with it that three years mandatory and the possible fine up to $25,000. Thank you. Mr. Myers and Mr. Haynes. We agree, right. Mr. Dorman, you understand? Thank you, Ms. Baron Allen. Uh, as to count 10, please. Thank you, Your Honor. Count 10 is charged pursuant to Ohio Revised Code Section 2905-0183 as kidnapping the felony of the first degree. There is also a firearm specification attached to that count. Uh, there is a presumption for prison um, attached to that count, and pregnant hopes would apply in any sentence that is imposed. There is a minimum term of 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, or 11 years, up to uh, the minimum term minimum term imposed plus one half. As an example, if 11 years was imposed, the prison sentence would be 11 to 16 and a half years pursuant to regular toast. 
The firearm specification, again, is a three years mandatory would have to be served prior and consecutive to any imposed prison term, and the fine is a possibility of up to $20,000. We agree, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Haynes. Mr. Dorman, do you understand that? I understand, Your Honor. And as thank you, Mr. Chairman Allen, as to count 11, please. Thank you, Your Honor. Count 11 is charged similarly, pursuant to Ohio Revised Code Section 2905-01A3, that is kidnapping, a felony of the first degree. There is a firearm specification. Again, there is a presumption for prison, and Greg and Chokes will apply in sentencing on that count. It carries with it a possible prison sentence of a minimum term of 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, or 11 years, up to the minimum term imposed plus one half. Again, and by way of example, if 11 years is imposed, it would be 11 to 16 and a half years. The firearm specification would be three years mandatory to be served prior and consecutive to any other imposed prison sentence, and the fine of $20,000. Thank you, Mr. Haynes. Mr. Dorman, do you understand? Yes. Thank you. As to count 12, please. Count 12, again, charged pursuant to Ohio Revised Code Section 2905-01A3, kidnapping, a felony of the first degree, as well as a firearm specification. As to the charge of kidnapping, there is a presumption of prison, and Greg and Chokes will apply in sentencing. The minimum term of prison that is possible will be 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, or 11 years, up to the minimum term imposed plus one half, again, by way of example, 11 to 16 and a half years. The firearm specification will be three years mandatory to be served prior and consecutive to any prison term imposed, and a possible fine of $20,000. Thank you. Mr. Myers and Mr. Haynes. We agree. Mr. Dorman, do you understand? I understand. Thank you. As to count 13, please. Count 13, also charged pursuant to Ohio Revised Code Section 2905-01A3, kidnapping, a felony of the first degree, as well as the firearm specification. There is a presumption for prison convicted of kidnapping, and Greg and Chokes will apply at sentencing. The minimum term possible would be 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, or 11 years, up to the minimum term imposed plus one half. Again, example, 11 years imposed, it would be 11 to 16 and a half years. The firearm specification is three years mandatory. Again, must be served prior and consecutive to any other prison sentence imposed, and a fine of $20,000. Thank you. Mr. Haynes or Mr. Meyer, we agree. Mr. Dorman, do you understand? Yes, sir. Thank you. As to count 14, please. Count 14 is charged pursuant to Ohio Revised Code Section 2905-01A2. Again, kidnapping, a felony of the first degree, as well as a firearm specification. There is a presumption for prison, and Greg and Chokes will apply at sentencing. The minimum term possible is 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, or 11 years, up to the minimum term imposed plus one half. Again, by way of example, 11 to 16 and a half years. The firearm specification is three years mandatory, and a $20,000 fine. Thank you. Mr. Meyer, do you understand? We agree. Mr. Dorman, do you understand? Yes, sir. Thank you. As to count 15, please. Count 15 is again charged pursuant to Ohio Revised Code Section 2905-01A2, kidnapping, a felony of the first degree, as well as a firearm specification. The kidnapping, there is a presumption for prison, and Greg and Chokes will apply at sentencing. The minimum term possible would be 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, or 11 years, up to the minimum term imposed plus one half. Again, by way of example, if 11 years is imposed, it would be 11 to 16 and a half years. The firearm specification is three years mandatory, and a $20,000 fine. We agree. Thank you. Mr. Dorman, do you understand? Yes, sir. Thank you. As to count 16, please. 16 is also charged pursuant to Ohio Revised Code Section 2905-01A2, kidnapping, a felony of the first degree, as well as a firearm specification. Again, there is a presumption for prison, and Greg and Chokes will apply at sentencing. The minimum term is 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, or 11 years, up to the minimum term imposed plus one half, which, for example, would be if 11 years are imposed, it would be 11 to 16 and a half years. The firearm specification is three years mandatory and a $20,000 fine. Thank you. Mr. Haynes. We agree, Your Honor. Thank you. Mr. Dorman, do you understand? Yes, sir. As to count 17, please. Count 17 is also charged pursuant to Ohio Revised Code Section 2905-01A2, kidnapping, a felony of the first degree, with a firearm specification. Again, there is a presumption for prison, and Greg and Chokes will apply at sentencing. The minimum term is 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, or 11 years, up to the minimum term imposed plus one half. Again, by way of example, if 11 years would be imposed, the prison sentence would be 11 to 16 and a half years. 
The fire specification is three years mandatory and the possible fine is three Thank you, Mr. Haynes. We agree. Mr. Gordon, you understand? Thank you, Mr. Allen. That's the count 18. Thank you, Your Honor. Count 18 is charged pursuant to Ohio Revised Code Section 290311A2. It is for his assault, a felony of the second degree, and there is a firearm specification attached to that. Again, there is a presumption for prison and convicted and regular jokes will apply at sentencing. The minimum term possible will be two, three, four, five, six, seven, or eight years, up to the minimum term imposed plus one half. Again, by way of example, if eight years would be imposed, the sentence would be eight to 12 years. The firearm specification is that three years mandatory, which must be served prior and consecutive to any other prison sentence imposed, and the possible fine is $15,000. Thank you, Mr. Haynes. We agree, Judge. All right. Mr. Gorman, you understand? Yes, sir. Thank you. As to count 19, please. Count 19 is charged pursuant to Ohio Revised Code Section 290311A1. That is also a felonious assault, a felony of the second degree, with a firearm specification. Again, there is a presumption for prison and regular service applies. The minimum term would be two, three, four, five, six, seven, or eight years, up to the minimum term imposed, plus one half. Again, by way of example, if eight years was imposed, the prison term would be eight to 12 years. The firearm specification is that three years mandatory, and the fine is $15,000. Thank you, Mr. Haynes. We agree, Judge. Mr. Gorman, you understand? Yes, sir. Thank you. As to count 20, please. Count 20 is charged pursuant to Ohio Revised Code Section 290311B2, a felonious assault that is a felony of the second degree, and there is a firearm specification attached to that count as well. There is a presumption for prison, and right in terms of applied sentencing. The minimum term is two, three, four, five, six, seven, or eight years, up to the minimum term imposed plus one half. Again, by way of example, if eight years is imposed on that count, the prison term would be eight to 12 years. The firearm specification is three years mandatory, and the fine $15,000. Thank you, Mr. Haynes. We're in agreement, Your Honor. Mr. Gorman? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. Thank you. As to count 21. Thank you, Your Honor. And as to count 21, that count is charged pursuant to Ohio Revised Code Section 290311A1, felonious assault, the felony of the second degree, and there is a firearm specification attached to that count as well. Again, there is a presumption for prison, and right in terms of applied sentencing. The minimum term would be two, three, four, five, six, seven, or eight years, up to the minimum term imposed plus one half. Again, by way of example, if eight years was imposed, the prison term would be eight to 12 years. The firearm specification is that three years mandatory, and the fine possible up to $15,000. Thank you, Mr. Haynes. We agree, Your Honor. Mr. Gorman, you understand? All right, I think that covers the entirety of the indictment. It does, Your Honor. All right. At this time, Mr. Myers and Mr. Haynes, based upon the recitation of the indictment and all the possible charges and possible sentences, what is the plea of your client at this time? The plea is not guilty, Your Honor. All right. We preserve the right to file a later plea. Absolutely. Thank you. Because of the nature of the judge, I should say, I think Mr. Myers touched on it, but it hasn't been quite 24 hours since he was indicted or read the indictment, so he's going to waive the 24-hour waiting period. Okay. Thank you. Would you please, Mr. Haynes, step up, and then if you and Mr. Myers could sign as attorneys for Mr. Gorman and then have Mr. Gorman sign. Which side, Judge? Thank you. So, for the record, Mr. Haynes, you signed. Mr. Myers signed, correct? Correct, Your Honor. All right. And Mr. Gorman, you signed as well. All right. As to bond status, Mr. Gorman. Yes, Your Honor. I'll be discussing bond. 
Your Honor, as the court is aware, pursuant to Article 1, Section 9 of the Ohio Constitution, this, uh... Judge, we're not going to object to the law. You passed on the law. Meaning that if he's asking for it, you're going to ask for a no bond? Correct. And is not opposing that. Are you comfortable with that? Well, no, the, the, uh, the Constitution says we're proof of evidence. And continue, right? Go on, continue, Judge. I think you are. Thank you, Your The court needs to have some understanding of the facts. What we have here is the plan and slaughter of three little boys, ages seven, four, and three. Uh, the first one shot was the four year old, shot in the house two times and sustained two bullet wounds to the head, causing his death. The second child shot was a seven-year-old who fled the residence, ran some 300 feet from the residence, and was gunned down from behind by the defendant. He then approached this little boy who was injured, incapacitated, alive, and shot him in the head twice. From a close distance, there were power burners in the boy's head. And then he went after the three-year-old. It was a struggle with the mother. He ripped the child from the mother's arms and put a bullet in his head. In close range, the powder burns on the three year old boy's head. Um, Your Honor, those facts uh, are important for the court to know in terms of this being a capital case. Uh, we find, Your Honor, my conclusion is, is that the proof is evident. And the presumption is great. We can be held with, without bail. All right. Thank you. Um, the defense has nothing to add. Yeah, you're right. All right. The court's going to order based upon Article 1 of the Ohio Constitution, Section 9, um, that's been amended on November 8, 2022, um, that um, the, the bond in this case be no bail at the present time. And what the court is going to do is prepare for, uh, an entry um, that contemplates that because my normal judgment entries do not contemplate um, Article 1, Section 9. So uh, we'll put one together indicating the court's order of no bail. Um, anything from the defense at this time? Anything else before? The court notes that the case is assigned to Judge Ferentz, and the uh, court date, we want to work around schedules. Um, do we have a date? Originally, it was set for July 5th. Is there another another day? Is that a bad day? Uh, it's up to the attorney. Can everyone do July 5th? I can do that, Judge. Yes, yes, yes sir. Okay. Mr. Myers. The, the fifth would work. I, I might indicate, as I'm now reminded by co-counsel Mr. Haynes, we're before this court the following day on Mr. Gilfoyle's case, and I would wonder if a tender. Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously, I, I'll work schedule. Well, we want to work with your schedule, but I think the heightened security is a little too much for oh. us to have both of them oh, I at, the, at the same time okay. because they're both they're both death penalty cases. So but I know you come a long way, but that's all right. Part, yeah. of, part of the job. All right. So we'll be down here on the fifth for a pre-trial. Then? Yes. Okay. And we're looking at the time right. because we're trying. I'm trying not to insert it on his regular docket so that. Judge Barron's has some time. Got you. It could be 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, or 1 o'clock. About 11. Is that all right with everybody? It's good to be here. Got it. Five. 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 Okay, 11 o'clock. Um, for the court's own edification, uh, Mr. Dorman, can you please tell me how old you are? 32. And what's your date of birth? 3191. And are you a citizen of the United States? Yes. All right. At this point, then, um, Mr. Haynes or Mr. Myers, is there anything else that you want the court to consider? 
General, I think just uh, on the technical front, we would uh, waive the reading of the indictment. We discussed that Thank with you. Mr. Dorman at length yesterday. Thank you. Um, would the defense um, have any issue? I'm just asking, waiting time till the next hearing. No, you Yeah. All right. Um, Terry, can you tell me that date again, please? July 5th, And we're going to call it a free trial. And then, uh, Mr. Myers and Mr. Haynes, would you please sign as attorneys for the defendant? Have Mr. Dorman sign, and then have one or all three of the prosecutors sign. Yeah, exactly. 
sabe de qué vas.